imagine going to the doctor for a routine checkup and discovering that you have six months to live. Would you worry about that parking ticket you got last week? Would you make plans for retiring once you reach the legal age? Now imagine that seven billion people, the entire population on earth, suddenly discover that they have a few weeks or months to live. Will they worry about endangered species, global warming, or terraforming the moon? But why even entertain such an unlikely scenario? Extinction never happens to us. Extinction always happens to someone else. To a future generation. Indeed, it never happens at all. Just when all is lost, hope grows in the belly of a woman. <laughs> Nevertheless, many prophets have predicted the end of man and their predictions never came true. We're still here. So why should you listen to yet another boy who cries wolf? And why am I raising the issue of extinction in a series that deals with physics? Isn't this a subject more appropriate for biology or paleontology? It turns out that relativists, futurologists, and their allies, the economists, have incorporated extinction within their respective fields. The scholars proclaim that statistics prove that man will live forever. The experts argue that exponential development of technology will enable humans first to evolve into post-humans, then to build starships and colonize the universe. Extinction takes man by surprise because in spite of forewarning, no one really believes that such a catastrophe can happen to an intelligent species. Therefore, it is imperative to determine whether the mathematicians are just daydreaming out loud. If you know that you are terminally ill, you may not want to postpone your dreams until the last minute. We are supposed to make a list of all the things we want to do in our lives before we kick the bucket. Cutesy. Alright, but now we can do this. We should do this. Now, I don't claim to know the last day and hour in which the last human will die. I will merely argue that man is terminally ill. Let's start with the objective facts. What is it that a living creature needs to stay alive? Well, it needs essentially three ingredients. Air, water, and food. A human can live without air for a few minutes, without water a few days, and without food at most a few weeks. Of the three vital inputs, food is the scarcest, largely because we produce it upon demand. What you may not be particularly aware of is that it wasn't always so. For over 100,000 years, man lived under a stable, natural economy, one that consists entirely of food. In the wild, an individual procures food directly. A little over 10,000 years ago, we began to domesticate plants and animals, and to trade our surpluses. For the first time, many individuals no longer obtained food directly. About 200 years ago, we experienced a revolution in manufacturing. Machinery made farming so efficient that laborers were no longer needed in such high numbers. People migrated to the cities, and agriculture became an ever smaller proportion of the global economy. The manufacturing phase lasted a fraction of the agricultural phase. We quickly developed the service sector and displaced both agriculture and manufacturing. Today, food constitutes only 4% of man's global economy and manufacturing a mere 30%. Will this trend continue until the global economy consists entirely of services? If not, when will it stop? Let's run all that by again and fast forward to get the big picture. For over 100,000 years, food constituted 100% of man's economy. There was roughly a 10 to 1 ratio between hunted and hunter. Then in the last 10,000 years, man gradually at first, and exponentially more recently, distanced himself from food. In a parallel development, we went from sparsely populated villages to densely populated towns and cities in a geologically brief interval of time. Humans don't live evenly spread out across the earth. Humans are distributed like ants, one ant hole here, another one there. 
Urbanization results in density-dependent birth rates. The global population is now guaranteed to grind to a halt one day. Unfortunately, man's artificial economy cannot survive on a constant or declining population. Sales are founded on the principle that there will be more demand next year. So what does the economy have to do with extinction? The basic ecological pyramid consists of three trophic levels, primary production, herbivores, and carnivores. A stable, healthy pyramid has roughly a 10 to 1 ratio between these levels. The mass of the higher level is roughly one-tenth of the mass of the next level. The natural world is an inefficient, wasteful world. Much food goes unconsumed and simply rots away. Man's artificial economy cannot run on such an inefficient 10 to 1 ratio. Efficiency demands that we produce food practically upon demand. But who produces food and for what reasons? The vast majority of food in the world is produced and distributed by agricultural corporations. Food is just another business and corporations produce it for profits. What we have done in the last 100,000 years, gradually at first and exponentially more recently, is overturn our ecological pyramid. The argument for extinction is simple. No profits, no food. One dark day, the global economy disintegrates. First thousands, then millions worldwide are laid off in a self-feeding cycle of increasing unemployment and decreasing consumer spending. Overnight, money loses its value and the agricultural corporations have no further incentives to produce or distribute food. The mobs have emptied the supermarket shelves. The delivery trucks have not arrived in weeks. You solemnly consume your last can of tuna. Now what? What will you exchange for food when food is the only thing that has any value? You may argue that this bleak scenario is impossible. Man's fantastic artificial economy cannot just vanish overnight. Can it? The facts show otherwise. Our economists have popularized the misleading notion that business comes in cycles. We've been through recessions and depressions before and miraculously recovered. What's different this time around is that we no longer have a manufacturing economy. The long-term economic trend is not cyclical as the economists would have you believe, but linear. We never returned to hunter-gathering, and we never went back from manufacturing to agriculture, and we certainly won't go back from services to manufacturing. The economists are fools if they predict that a constant or declining population will thrive under a service regime for the next million years. In fact, not one expert out there can tell you how the service sector intends to create jobs. Everyone merely extrapolates trends and tells you that the economy is somehow going to recover. In the past, governments were able to stimulate agriculture and manufacturing by putting people to work in labor-intensive jobs. Today we use sophisticated machines to do agriculture, road work, and manufacturing. If the government sent millions of unemployed to the farms and factories, the corporations would send the masses marching right back. The day our global economy disintegrates, every person on earth, from Bill Gates to Bill Gatey, is suddenly unemployed. That day, you instantly become a hunter. But what else is there to hunt in the urban jungle out there if not another human? Widespread starvation, coupled with rampant cannibalism among top predators, is what guarantees the exponential decrease of their population. A mass extinction is not the result of nuclear war, disease, or extraterrestrial impacts. A mass extinction is by definition a catastrophic economic collapse. It occurs when the ecological pyramid overturns and the many end up chasing after the few. In the coming videos I will argue that a mass extinction is an inevitable, natural process which politicians and economists, intelligence and technology can do nothing about. And if humans cannot avoid their own extinction in spite of their magical ability to foresee events, neither could any other species of plants or animals in the history of life on Earth.